to see such a big crowd. I hope this turns out better than the Tuesday night television. <laughs> it's an interesting thing when you start looking through newspapers to find information because it's kind of a limited resource. You have to remember that reporters are not experts in any particular field for the most part, especially a hundred years ago. And they kind of went on observation and uh, public opinion. What did other people see or what did they think? Uh, there were lots of articles written, and sometimes you can tell how important the item was by where it came in the newspaper, saying as now about the fold, below the fold on page 27, under the obituaries, things like that. It tells you how important that particular item had become. When it's front page right up near the, near the banner head, then you know this is significant. Some of these articles that you'll see, and I'll give you the synopsis of them, uh, were on the front page, others kind of hidden. Uh, but it's, it's always interesting to me to see or to experience the language that was used and the vocabulary, the idioms that uh, they used for expressing different things. This was not a time when higher education was present throughout the population, but it is, or it seems to me, kind of sophisticated uh, writing for the time. When we look at an isolated incident, as this tends to be, we have to look at the events surrounding it. What was going on in the bigger picture of the world, the state, the nation, and the local area? So we look at the times, and as Sue said, and I want to thank Sue for helping put all of this together and put up with my editing and changes at the last minute. Electricity was the new technology of this period of time. And everybody wants to be there and part of a new technology. I mean, how much did we spend for computers when they first came out? Now we can buy them for a few hundred. Initially, they were $3,000 to buy a computer that did about a tenth what they'll do now. So we want to be there where the technology is. And with electricity, people could now have, as Sue said, electric lights in the house. You could have an electric fan on a hot night. You could have an electric washing machine. If you look around your house now, you can see all the other things that have been added since uh, that time. The Industrial Revolution was well underway. Changes were happening all the time. Lots of new inventions, new manufacturing processes were uh, in effect. It was a new world. In 1895, Gillette patented the safety razor. No more cutthroat razors were needed. So that was a pretty major change. The x-ray was discovered. It wasn't invented. It was always there. They just didn't know it. That was pretty significant in changing the practice of medicine. In 1896, Henry Ford built his first gasoline-powered quadricycle, which was like two bicycles with a wagon seat connecting them. Didn't look a whole lot different to that. And in 1897 was the Yukon Gold Rush. So this was a time of movement. People were getting around and doing different things and trying different things, and they all wanted to be right there where it was happening, or they wanted to bring it to their town. And that's basically what happened. With the possibility of electricity came the streetcar. They'd already existed for some time in other areas, urban centers and small towns. A lot of, a lot of streetcar companies existed in the state of Maine. Well, they helped move the population because no longer did people need to live within walking distance of their place of work, a factory. They could live in what became the suburbs. People with land outside the city now could sell it or develop it. So we had a new industry growing up. Okay, now we're going to try this. As, I'm a no-tech sort of person. We'll see if this it works. All right. At this time, the year before that we're talking about, May 1894, most of the village was burned to the ground. There was not a whole lot left. The opera house was gone, the fire station was gone, the tannery, most of the houses and businesses gone. 
But within a year, much of the village was rebuilt. And that was a good thing. On July 1st, 1895, the Norway and Paris Street Railway began operating between Pleasant Street, Norway, and Market Square in South Paris. Actually, on July 1st, it only went as far as the Grand Trunk. They hadn't made the crossover yet, but eventually it did. In those days, the motorman and conductor worked 10 hours, earned a dollar fifty, and the street railway operated seven days a week. You can do the math, it's less than 10 bucks a week. But this was one of the better paying jobs. Now, the Oxford Central Electric Railroad, was it a good idea? It was innovative. It could have served the purpose, but it would have had some problems. And one of those problems is very similar to what the Norway and Paris Street Railway ran into. In the wintertime, in case you're new in the area, we get a lot of snow. <laughs> The Norway and Paris had a homemade plow that they pushed with one of these little cars, and I called them little, they were called 20-foot boxes, because that's how long they were. And then they had a 5-foot platform on each end for the motor and the conductor. And it pushed this plow, but it could only push it in one direction. Then they had to turn around and push the other direction. That was for a light snow. For a heavy snow, the tracks were cleared by men with shovels. This was 2.13 miles. The Oxford Central was 21 miles. Can you see a problem there? <laughs> okay, good. Steam power might have been a better choice. Now here's tonight's question. And you don't need to answer this out loud. I don't want to embarrass anyone. What is today's date? Everyone got it? Okay. Keep it in mind. I'll be asking again. In November of 1896, the newspaper reported that the talked of electric road between Norway and North Waterford is again being agitated. I just like the wording of that. The idea had been floated around town amongst businessmen, because remember, this was the center. Norway was a hub of activity, economic and political, and there was some money here, and people wanted to invest. They wanted to move the town along and make it grow. In December, and this brings a question to mind, why would you start surveying a railroad line predominantly through pastures and woods in the winter time. But they did, and I'm, I'm guessing they probably went out there and put in stakes to kind of mark out where they wanted it to be. Well, surveying this proposed route began at the western end. Was that a political move? Mm. Bring the western area into the game? Well, it also had another effect. The, <clears throat> the Bridgeton and Saco Railroad, which was a narrow gauge, started to become a little bit worried because if the trolley line went down to Bridgeton, or to Harrison rather, that was going to kind of step on the turf of the narrow gauge. So they hired surveyors, and they're going to see if they can get a railroad line up to Harrison. But of course, there's always finance involved, and is Harrison going to come to the game and bring some money? They didn't know, but that was the question. Everybody wants someone else to finance their idea. Nothing's changed. There was also talk of a standard gauge connection between the Norway trunk line and Waterford. Because there's lots of talk, and as they say, talk is cheap. At the same time, there were people interested in bringing a line, uh, non-specific motive power, from uh, Westbrook in to Bridgeton. 
and maybe up to Harrison. So everybody wanted to be in this game. The Oxford Central route was eventually examined by John Clifford of Clifford Years Construction Company, and the promoter of this operation, his name was Eugene Eastman. He was from Auburn, and they, they examined the line once again with representatives from North Waterford, Albany, and East Stoneham. Anyone left out of that? <laughs> there was a public meeting in Waterford, and that kind of got Norway businessmen thinking uh, and showing some interest in the project. The recommended route is from Rice's Junction near the East Waterford Post Office into Norway. The power station the maintenance facility and the car barn would also <coughs> be located at Rice's Junction. A line would be sent then to Waterford Flat, South Waterford Harrison, and Bridgeton. Pretty ambitious. The initial proposal was for the towns to fund the railroad. Now there's a good plan. You come up with an idea and decide who's going to fund it for you. Do you think that worked? Most of you have been around here longer than I have. <laughs> I'm guessing it didn't fly. Plan B was form a stock company. And that's what they ended up doing. There were a lot of interesting, interested parties. The creamery owner thought this was a good idea. Farms out in the, the western areas. Stock dealers, farmers, lumber dealers. Lumber was a huge industry. Building was going on everywhere. So a lot of lumber was required and, uh, and being moved. Uh, property values were increasing or would increase if this whole thing actually happened. Maine at the time had three profitable interurban electric railway systems. One of them was just down here, the Atlantic Shoreline, which ran between Cape Corpus and Sanford. And their main uh, commodity was moving coal into the good old mills. It worked for getting people to the casino at Cape Corpus too, which was not a gambling house, it was just restaurant and dancing. They didn't know how to have fun. <laughs> Make sure I'm in the right place. Okay. The railroad finally was uh, surveyed and the route from Rice's Junction into Norway is described in this article. You don't really need to read it. I could make it bigger. She showed me how. But uh, that's just so you don't have to keep staring at me. In January of 1897, the railroad backers are still looking for stock subscriptions from citizens and from the towns. Stoneham was the first one to dive in with a pledge of $3,500, which is pretty substantial. If you figure people are making a dollar and a half a day for a town, a small town, to commit $3,500, that, that's substantial. Well, what did the route look like? It looked like this. And you can see how it connects. Oh, wait, I've got a red dot I can use here. It connects from South Paris over here into Norway, along the lake, and then to Waterford, and so forth. But it appears to me that the intention was to connect to the Norway and Paris. <coughs> that would be a problem, because the Oxford Central was going to be using very much heavier cars to run and carry freight. The little cars of the Norway and Paris could get away with much lighter rail, which would not stand up under this heavier use. Waterford at this point came to the meeting and pledged $10,000. Very substantial amount. However, they insisted for this $10,000 that the power station, the car house, and the, ma the maintenance building be located at Rice's Junction. What would that do for them? Well, they're going to sell a lot of lumber. They're going to provide um, wages to people who are building these buildings. They were substantial buildings. They're going to sell some land. And 
it's going to put them in the center of things, plus it's going to take electricity to Waterford. So that was, uh, this, that was a good plan there. Here are the costs enumerated in an article. You can see by the, by the headline here. That's a substantial headline for the time, right up at the top of the page. It calls it some interesting news and figures. Costs were estimated by Beerson Clifford of Lewiston to be $2,000 a mile. That's what it was going to cost them. They weren't bringing in any fill. They were using simply whatever nature provided to build these road beds. So it was going to cost $2,000 a mile for grading, ballasting, and track laying. $62,000 was the total amount for that part of the work. That's, that's a per, pretty good chunk of change. Lovell and Albany would allow the track to be put through their areas, but they weren't going to give any money at this point. Keep that in mind. Also at this point, General George Beale came out opposed to this project. He was a director of the Norway and Paris Street Railway, but his concern was that it was going to take business away from the people who were hauling these goods by horse and wagon, and they would be uh, left out. The man behind all of this, maybe I can make it a little bigger, we'll see, his name was Eugene Eastman, and he came from Auburn. Initially, he had been a lime salesman, for Francis Cobb Company of Rockland. He believed in the project so much that he gave up a good paying job and began gathering facts and trying to put backers together to fund this whole project. He thought it would be a good benefit to the area, but now he needed to gain local support. Capitalization for the project was calculated to be $110,000. The financial investors would contribute $60,000 after $50,000 was raised from the local area, public and private subscription. And we find this is a recurring theme throughout this whole operation. I'll put my money in after you get this money, or I'll pay after you get the job done, kind of thing. I don't know what they were supposed to do the job with to begin with, but uh, that's the way it worked. Now, by comparison, remember I told you the Norway and Paris was 2.13 miles when they actually ran the whole distance. That was capitalized at $43,000. For two miles of running with four little cars and enough motors to run two of them. In the summertime, they put the motors on the open cars. In the wintertime, they put the motors on the closed cars. That's the way they operated. And they were $43,000 to go two miles. <coughs> so 110 doesn't sound to me like anywhere near enough to do this job. At a special town meeting, which coincidentally was held on, on a Grange day. So there were a lot of people in town, a lot of farmers were there. And at a town meeting, they voted 238 to 80 to contribute $10,000 to be held as stock in this company and paid when the line was completed. <laughs> Once again, the same problem. The Norway Selectman. Oh, we can make that small. So you can see the whole thing. The Norway Selectman changed their mind, or at least uh, changed the, the wording of this. This was to give permission to the Oxford Central to use the roads and roadways in the town, in the village itself, for the construction and operation of the railroad. And that, that's what they were doing here, giving permission. But they changed a piece because in the initial survey, 
it said that the track would be laid along the lake on the bank side of the road, which is where the, the, the hillside goes up. The selectmen wanted the track on the lake side so that when they cleared the snow off, it would go into the lake. How do you think the EPA might feel about that? <laughs> this one highlights the benefits of the Oxford Central to the small towns and the lake areas to the west. There was even an investor who was planning, if this went through, to build a summer hotel of 300 rooms out in Albany Basins. <laughs> On March 5th, Albany's in for $2,000. Remember, I said they weren't going to do anything except let them put the, the tracks through. But now, we get to March, they're in the game for $2,000. Now, the local subscriptions, although unpaid but pledged, are up to $35,500. Also in March of 97, the directors elected officers and they established an office in Freeland House Block. Here's a map of the area. And you can see where Rice's Junction is here and the roadways that, uh, that are shown here are pretty much what exists today. The roads haven't changed a whole lot. Quality or direction. <laughs> This article spells out the contract, that's the, in the bigger section of reading if you want to read that, uh, and it says that from Norway to East Stone is 17 miles, Rice's Junction to South Waterford is 4 miles, so now we're up to 21 miles of track that's got to be put in and roadbed that has to be built. It also uh, nails down the dimensions and capacities of the powerhouse which was going to be a steam operated system and the generators and so forth that were going to power these cars that were running the 21 miles. It also described the car house and the rolling stock was to be three 40 foot cars. That's the size of a full size city bus. And it probably was a little bigger because it doesn't count the platforms at the end where the motorman and conductor operated. Now these were interurban cars. These weren't the little ones like the Norway and Paris had. Norway and Paris could replace the cars anytime they wanted to because there was lots of those cars floating around. There were so many street railways at the time. Those could be bought pretty cheaply. These interurbans, companies bought them new and used them till they fell apart. And they often did. But the parts were available. So these were big and heavy. They had four motors on each car, and each car had to be capable of hauling three or four fully loaded freight cars. So that's a substantial weight that's going to be traveling over this line, hauled by an electric vehicle running off a copper wire overhead carrying 600 volts of DC current. And, and it could be done. Over the right landscape, it did work. Uh, the uh, the Aroostook Valley Railroad was that, that type of system. Now these 40-foot cars were half passenger cars, so you still had 20 feet of passengers, and 20 feet of baggage or express or freight. So they could carry things in that same car, which was good for ballast. <coughs> It also described the snow sweepers and work cars to be included. The snow sweepers, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the way they moved snow off these tracks. They had enormous reed bristles in a rotating drum and it just flailed the snow out of the way. And when these things came down the tracks, because they'd be sweeping in reverse to the way the wheels were going, it would look like a blizzard coming at you. But the snow had to be pretty light. You wanted to get it before it packed. Because once it packed, you've got the snow shovels again coming out. 
So they had to run these cars all night long if it was a nice time <coughs> snowstorm. You got to run them all the time to, to keep the tracks clear. In this one, the railroad commissioners met with the directors at Beale's Hotel on the first Tuesday in August. And they made some practical changes, you know, minor things, but uh, the surveyors and the managers had to stay up all night making sure this, the wording was correct. After the meeting, they took a horse-drawn wagon, all of them loaded into it, I think it was a four-seater, and they went out to a lake house in Waterford for dinner. I guess all the restaurants in town were closed. And strangely enough, two days later on Thursday, approval was received from the Railroad Commission. A week later, imagine that. The workers arrived. Can you imagine now getting government approval for anything in two days? <laughs> and then a week later the whole thing starts? This, this operation was not known for its good planning. And somehow these workers arrive from Boston a week after approval is granted. Somebody had a great crystal ball. 125 workers and loads of equipment. They said the truck loads or the, the wagon loads of equipment headed out to Norway Center uh, were just phenomenal. Taking mostly, it was all hand stuff. Picks, shovels, wheelbarrows, uh, all hand work. The work started in North Norway, working toward the lake. This is a picture I like. This comes from Sid Gordon's collection. It's one of two photographs. Now this is one of the biggest things to happen in town and no one had a camera? <laughs> Where was the box brownie? For goodness sakes. But it's a great picture. Keep your eye on. It's not going to move. But that water jug, we're going to see again in the next picture. Here they are sitting around and look at the great accommodations they've got. You see that sod hot? How would you like to spend a damp week in that? That would be fun. But they're, they're sitting around, they're all wearing their vests and their hats, and that's the way people dressed at the time. They were transported to the Alfred White House farm at Norway Center, and they set up camp there. There's the water jug again, plus some other, probably a lunchbox or something down there. It looks like they're playing, I don't know if that's checkers or something with little little pegs. They're relaxing after working because on the first day of working on this project they completed a half mile of roadbed. That's pretty substantial. And you figure that they're digging it and heaping it up to make the roadbed. And it was established on Rufus Morrill's land headed toward Norway Lake. In a few days another hundred workers are due to arrive. Everything looks pretty calm and peaceful, going well, half a mile. Selectmen of Norway then decided they needed to notify the officers of the company that before they could cross the town farm property, they needed to pay land damages. It's probably the equivalent of buying a right-of-way. But to make their point, they arrested two of the crew foremen for trespass, and they held them until the bond was issued. And now we get to the really interesting yeah. part. Mm -hmm. September 15th, a Wednesday, I remember it well. <laughs> it was payday. Six weeks after they started, payday of Wow, going six, six weeks without any, any pay. But they've been on the job since early August. Company president, now this is, this is on payday, the 15th, the company president, Fred Wilson, his name is, he's out of Boston, and the grading contractor, Davis, are in New York arranging for the payroll. 
Now, if you're in business, do you wait till payday to arrange the payroll? I don't want to work for that company. <laughs> that doesn't sound like it's a going thing. They must have forgotten to check the calendar, that's all. Okay, now remember, I asked you what today's date was. How many guests? September 17th. <laughs> Very good. Ten points each. And that just happens to be 116 years ago today. <laughs> Did you plan this? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I never realized that. <laughs> 116 years ago today, the workers being the bright sparks that they were, decided there was a good chance they were not going to be paid. <laughs> they needed an edge. So they thought, you know, if we take some hostages, we have a bargain chip here. And so began the rebellion. Unsuspecting foreman Robert Davis and timekeeper James Hallett just happened to be riding in their carriage through Rice's Junction. How handy for the workers. The workers, with knives and revolvers, suddenly surrounded them. These very peaceful guys around the campfire. Now they've got revolvers and knives and clubs and rocks and stuff, and they stop the wagon, and they drag Davis, uh, Davis right out of the wagon. Hallett whips the horse up and, and gets going down the road, but there's another group of them down there, because they were in groups of 40 in teams, and they stopped him. So now they had two hostages. Management. They had management. But there was a third hostage to be taken, and now I think he's just an interesting character. This would be a great piece of work for a miniseries. <laughs> we, to be a miniseries, though, it would have to have a romantic component, a lot more gunfire, and some really super explosions. They didn't have too much of any of those, but, uh, you know, it, it could be worked in there, a little bit of poetic license. Felix Sertosimo. <clears throat> he was an entrepreneur and sutler, which means he sold stuff to the workers. He was a businessman. Here they are, miles from town. They're not coming in here to get a new pair of socks. They're going to buy them from Felix. Sewing kit, he had it. Maybe some tobacco, paper rollers, new pipe, handkerchief, a hat. Who knows what he sold. But he was the company store. Of course, he sold it on credit and at inflated prices like most company stores. So, he was not a popular figure. And so they took him as a hostage as well. The workers threatened to hold the hostages until they were paid. Or, if they weren't paid, they'd kill the hostages. So it's getting ugly. In a hurry. And it said in the newspaper, that the hostages spent an anxious night. <laughs> 116 years ago, right now. <laughs> they were sitting around the campfire, not feeling very happy or secure about the future. The next day was Saturday, and word reached Norway of the hostage taking. There's a communication system. Somebody must have sent a carrier pigeon. 911 didn't exist. During the day, the hostages were allowed to wander around the camp, closely watched. See how well planned this whole thing was? So Tosimo, this is why I, I like this guy. He had a silver tongue. And he convinced them, here these people haven't been paid for six weeks. The guy who's been ripping them off for six weeks says, hey, wait a minute, I can get this money for you. Let me go to town, I'll get it. <laughs> you have to have a cabbage head to believe a story like that. <laughs> and they said, oh, okay. So they sent three guards with it. <laughs> three people, three of their workers, must have been their best and brightest went with him 
to make sure he brought back the money. Okay, somehow, he slipped away from Larry, Moe, and Curly, <laughs> and he locked himself in the railroad station. I don't know how you do that. What, were they distracted by a Mensa meeting? Or a lady who needed help across the road? What got their attention? Their wages are waiting for them. And he gets away and locks himself in a building and then gets on a train to Boston. Because <laughs> he left his business behind, but I think that was gone anyway. <laughs> James Hallett, the timekeeper, saw an opportunity to escape, to escape and headed into the woods with several of the laborers behind him. One of them caught up with him and they got to fighting and he knocked the other guy out. So he must have been pretty good with his fists. Three war workers showed up or finally caught up to him. They probably weren't on the track team. And he pulled a gun. He had a revolver that he had hidden during his captivity. Now he brings it out. And he held them off, turned them away, whatever it was he did. He managed somehow to get back to Norway and then decided maybe he should disappear. Good thing, I would say. Robert Davis was now the lone hostage, captive. Then he was sweating bullets. Because he didn't know what was going on. These, these are not happy people. Local citizens put pressure on the company to resolve this issue quickly and take some action. State detective Albert Bassett was accompanied by chief engineer Lewis Wilson, brother of the company president, Fred Wilson, and two others to negotiate with the angry mob. I'm guessing negotiation was not in the academic uh, cycle at that time because the mob saw an opportunity and demanded that Chief Engineer Wilson now be a hostage. He's got a cop with him and some other people and they're just going to take one more hostage. I guess they were outnumbered. At this point a telegram was sent to Sheriff Fred Porter to get his assistance. He arrived by train and along with Judge Seward Stearns and four deputies rode out to camp. But they didn't make any progress either. Now, one of the only remaining pieces of communication from this company, you see it's on company letterhead, it has the names of the officers up there, it looks like a time listed at the top, but no date, so we'll it fits within this, this time frame. And there's a lot of desperation in this wording here. It says, no word from anybody underlined yet. No possibility to do anything until money is deposited in New York about to wire them. Lou. I, I would think the only Lou in the whole story is Lewis Wilson. So, I'm going to give him credit for it. Now, the next one shows that Lou had no political aspirations of the 21st century. Because there is a little political incorrectness in his writing. Again, we don't know who it's written to, but he says, Please stay at the shanty tonight to be sure none of the Italian workers get away. <laughs> Sincerely yours. Now we're sincere. <laughs> How appropriate. You know, this guy came from Boston. And 50 years later, a Boston politician was known to say, never write when you can speak. Don't speak if you can nod. Never nod when you can wink. <laughs> Don't leave a trail. Good thing they didn't have email. What could have said that? <laughs> The sheriff was convinced that a hostage rescue attempt was likely to result in someone being killed. So all the sheriff did was fan the flames. He really 
did nothing to move anything forward. It was reported that the workers offered the hostages, two of them now, separately, the chance to escape. <laughs> but the hostages were getting pretty cluey. And they figured out that if one of them escaped, the other one was not going to have a nice ending. So they refused. They said, no, no, that's okay. We'll stay as hostages. <laughs> the sheriff took another approach. And he got a priest to come out. You're being good Italians. He got a priest who was Father M.D. Suma, who was supposedly a man of tact and ability, said in the newspaper. And I guess he spoke several languages. He was supposed to convince them to find a peaceful solution to this. Peaceful, schmeaceful. They wanted their money. That's what they wanted. So that didn't work either. Contractor Davis arrived back from Boston to explain that the delay was due to illness of the financing broker. I didn't know that cold feet was a medical <laughs> disease. The money was to arrive Tuesday or Wednesday. Okay, great. I don't think the workers believed it. There was a sense amongst the workers that the military might be used. Now, I don't know how they knew this. It took a day for the word of the hostage taking to get from uh, Rice's Junction to Norway and they got word from Augusta somehow that the military might be used, and guess what? They were right, because the military authorities in Augusta had placed Company D on alert. So, the Italians made it very clear that if the military was brought in and used against them, the hostages would be cut up into as many pieces as the dollars owed the workers. <laughs> A grisly thought. 2300 bucks, that's what they were owed. Now do the math. Let's write it off. Let's say there were 230 workers. And they're owed 2300 bucks. Six weeks of hard labor for $10? That's incredible. This, this is an important map. It's the same one as you saw before, but just in case you forgot. Here's Rice's Junction over here. Right here, I believe, is Howe Hill. Many years, well, several years, quite a few years ago, I was talking to Ted Howe, who lived right here, and had grown up on that, that area. And we were talking about the Oxford Central Electric. And he said, well, his father had told him that the rebellion actually occurred in this field right here. And it's still a field today. And if you go through the field, eventually you'll bump into the roadbed that these guys built 116 years ago. And it goes right up to the river and stops. So that's where it happened, but the newspaper, of course, says it was Rice's Junction, which is just a little bit beyond. The residents of the area were understandably curious about what was going on. Someone else's disaster is always a curiosity. And they would drive their wagons and carriages out through the area to have a look and see what was going on. But no one was ever bothered. The, the workers, as long as you weren't trying to uh, stage an escape for anyone, they were okay with that. Here's Albert Bassett. Now this is from 1898, when he was nominated as a candidate for sheriff. They changed the story in this one a little bit, and they said that uh, the hostages as far as the hostages were, were concerned, they would chop them up into inch pieces. That would be quite, a, quite an operation instead of the 2300. Right. Deputies Bassett and Cyrus Wormel devised the plan. They came up with an escape plan. They would use two wagons with teams of horses to secure the escape 
of Wilson and Davis. Bassett would mingle, as the newspaper said, with the workers and join in their sports and kind of edge them away from these wagons. He and Wormel had each driven a wagon up there, and Wormel stayed with the wagon, and Bassett went down to do whatever they were doing. I'm sure it wasn't baseball. And, uh, you know, getting their attention moved to a different place. Well, this is an illustration. Once again, no box brownie, but this was out of the Lewiston paper. So they had somebody who could draw. And, and you can see they've got clubs, revolvers, knives, rocks, all kinds of things. These are people who are really worked up into a frenzy now. Sunday night, around 6 p.m., the plan was to take effect. Davis, it was reported, panicked. And he dove into that wagon just as soon as he could. But he was followed uh, by uh, the other hostages. So Wilson and Davis both escaped. And in the, in the process, two of the workers were run over by the wagon. One of them got a broken leg, the other one uh, was banged up a bit, but not seriously. The workers were now enraged. They were really upset before, but now they're enraged. This is the, these are the words from the newspaper uh, because of the successful escape. But now Bassett was the center of attention. And he found himself surrounded by these very hostile individuals. At some point, he fired his revolver, and that resulted in a scalp wound for one of the workers. The mob then attacked the detective with whatever they could find. This is what they're doing in this picture. In the confusion, once again, we've got confusion, he managed to escape to Waterford Flat where he discovered that he had been shot in the shoulder. And I believe he carried the bullet in his shoulder for the rest of his life. He did receive some treatment for the injury, but made his way into Norway by dawn the next day, on Monday. People passing through the area found that it wasn't such a friendly environment anymore, and some people did get roughed up just passing through to see what was going on, but nothing very terrible. The level of anger was so high amongst the workers that at one point they turned on their own. They started beating up on a guy they thought hadn't done enough to stop the escape. The town of Norway now is in an anxious state, according to the reporter. Can you imagine an anxious state? The street lights, to let you know how anxious this was, the street lights were left on all night. <laughs> they didn't go off by midnight. All night they burned those lights, and they put on extra watchmen. There was no police department. The watchmen were hired by the businesses to check the door, make sure there were no fires, all this kind of thing. So they put on extra watchmen just to make sure that things stayed peaceful. The injured Italian workers were brought to town Monday morning for treatment at Dr. Bradbury's home. Uh, the men who were run over by the wagons and uh, the others injured in fighting amongst themselves. At one point there was an article uh, that said that when they cleaned out the room where the workers had been treated, they found a revolver under one of the beds. And they said that would, he probably brought that so uh, you know it wouldn't cause harm to anyone. Right, let's see, you're, you're in a, a past for a hospital, pretty vulnerable position. I'm guessing the guy had intentions of protecting himself. Things, things, as I said, were quieting down. People were able to visit the camp again. And some of the workers were seen in town. They still just wanted their pay. Chief Engineer Wilson was showing great confidence that his brother was going to return, straighten things out, and work would be progressing by the end of the week. Public opinion 
was moving to the side of the workers. The company was not very high on their list. On Tuesday, most of the workers left the camp and came to town. They didn't cause any trouble, and the local residents offered them food and accommodation in Norway Hall. And we found that Norway Hall was the name of the auditorium in the opera house. In the old one, and I guess they just generalized it to the new one. So they were allowed to stay in Norway Hall. They were also offered accommodation in rail cars. Most of them refused because you can lock a building and you can move a rail car. They wanted their money. So they weren't going to do any of that. They'd been living outdoors. They could camp on a lawn or in a park. So that didn't bother them. Tuesday, the workers, as I said, left camp, came to town. Some of them, uh, well, all of them were offered transportation back to Boston. But they decided they'd stay until uh, the money showed up. Rumors spread that Wednesday would be payday. Aren't rumors great? They keep everyone just alive with hope. But this time, the treasurer of the company, Judge Stearns, showed up and convinced them, there's no money coming. There's nothing. Three quarters of the men at this point decided to leave, go to Boston, see if they could get legal advice. Another interesting rumor that shows that spinning information is not new. Rumor circulated that the deputies had violated the law by assisting in the escape and planning the escape. Their response, or the response was, that since the events took place on a public road, the deputies were merely helping the men into a wagon for a ride to town. <laughs> Great spinning. The Italian workers seem to have appreciated the help that the residents offered, and uh, you know, they didn't cause any problems, but there was still some uncertainty amongst the residents as to whether there might be another uprising. As this whole story ended, an article appeared that said, much credit is due D.S. Sanborn, who owned the newspaper, for the manner in which he handled the problem, and it was through his kind offices and firmness, assisted by others, that a riot was averted and the Italians were sent home. He is reported to have offered them free transportation to Portland and then down to Boston. I believe it was rail to Portland and then steamer to Boston. And he would fund it, or he would find the funding to do this. And many of them took him up on the offer. They found when they got to Portland, though, there were people who saw this as an opportunity to get to Boston, and suddenly there were a lot more workers than ever showed up here trying to go back to Boston. <coughs> Things haven't changed. This scandal did result in stricter regulation of contractors using outside labor gangs and required bonds to guarantee the payment of wages. An interesting letter notifying the inhabitants of Norway of what the selectmen intended to do at the end of this whole thing. They wanted the inhabitants to know that they would attempt to collect costs paid by the town during the uprising. They were writing to the state to get the state to fund their coverage. To the extent of $16.35. Thank goodness they didn't have to raise taxes. Even though no more work was ever done on the construction of the Oxford Central, the directors of the railroad elected officers in December of 1898. They may have had to keep it alive for long enough to uh, come to a conclusion of some sort. In 1905, another plan came to light for the creation of the Norway and Western 
Railway. That never was carried out either. And recently, the newspaper carried an article uh, of the idea of a night train from Montreal to Portland. So you see, the romance of the railroad still lives. I'm glad it does. And that's it. <laughs> Probably some of you have more information on this. I did try to keep it down to two hours. <laughs> yes? And I understand that between the Morrow Road and the Greenwood Road, that that rail bed is out there. There, there are several places uh, where where the road bed still exists because they never took it down. Yes. Uh, they, just, they just humped it up. It's just built up. Now most of it's grown up with trees and things in a lot of places. It, yeah, uh, the, I became aware of it. It's the farm where the brown farm on the left point in from the Waterford Road. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike and Carrie Conley live there and she told me that it's out there and the kids used to go out there and play on it. So it's yeah. out there. I don't know exactly if there's a beginning or an end to it out there, but it's out there. Well, they had, they had teams, as I said, of 40 workers. With, a, with supervisors and they would build sections each and then eventually bring all the sections together it was the plan and uh, there are several places as we mentioned before uh, where those hummocks still exist mm -hmm. and uh, they never took them out uh, they worked out to put them there <laughs> who was going to take them away <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to what all those workers all this time. I'm not well, surprised they didn't loop the town. Yeah, it's, well, the, the reports were that they got along very well with the neighbors and uh, they were camped in on farmland. So they bought produce, I'm guessing vegetables, fruit, eggs, whatever was in season from the farmers in the area. And uh, one report was that the, the workers even invited the families to come have dinner with them. So, you know, it, it was a good working relationship initially. People got along, and uh, but they had to bring money with them. And you go six weeks without any pay. Maybe they were maybe they were hunting in the woods. I don't know. But they certainly had the wherewithal to do that. Maybe they brought a cook with them, like the lover camp she was going to have, have a cook. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of specifics that seem to be missing uh, from the whole story because we don't know what the company did. All, we're, all we have is what happened when it didn't work. And, uh, and a lot of it is you know, people's opinion or observations, which sometimes are <coughs> Oh, I'm just glad that the directors of the Norway Branch Railroad don't have these same thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> right, Dennis Gray? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, I think Elaine, like you, thinks that she has a road bed back of her house. She lives uh, going into the Wiley Road there, I think. Mm -hmm. back in her, she's, uh, and I can remember going down uh, to my grandfather's house place uh, to the, the field and the field. There was two bridges there, I think, across the uh, Crooked River uh, there at that point, at that junction. Yeah, there's, there's no mention in any of this either about the overhead line, which would have been an expense, because copper has never been cheap. And there had to be poles put in at regular intervals, and then the wire had to run that would take the power. And I, I haven't found anything that talks about the overhead system unless that was rolled into the, uh, the powerhouse part of the uh, contract. But uh, there are some specific things that just seem to slip by. And it, it would seem to me that the failure of it was in large part due to undercapitalization. Uh, they just didn't have, well, and nobody threw any money in. I don't know what they bought the tools with. I'm guessing whoever provided the implements to do this work was left hanging as well. 
I don't know. I don't know who paid to get them up on from Boston, but they got here, and nobody had any except the town had a concern for getting them back. So you know, there's a, there's a lot of pieces in there that just didn't come together, and there probably was not a whole lot of money that they were working with. Probably a very minimal amount. Uh, lots pledged, but not much paid. And well, when they couldn't come up with twenty-three hundred dollars, I'm guessing that they had a, a pretty small treasury. How much would it have cost to get the workers back to Boston? I think it was, from what I've seen in advertising, it was about a dollar or a dollar ten to take the steamer from Portland to Boston. So that would be two hundred and twenty-five dollars. There and I don't know what a train ticket costs to go from from Norway to uh, to Portland, but it, it probably was considerably less than a dollar, probably in the cents. But still, it was a day's pay for, for most people. Interesting. Few years later, I think around 1945. We had all the Italians come up from there and take the stores over home. Yeah. So some yeah. of might have been the same. Could have been the same. Well, <laughs> so by then they had this new regulation where they had to be a bond so that they could pay. Because there was some good that came out. It's, and they weren't afraid to come back, which is a credit to them. And a lot of good big head in the horns in Paris at that time was so all. Captain H.N. Bolster. Uh, it was about the same time they were putting the new bridge over the Androscog in the upper end there. <clears throat> and uh, he wanted to be the first one to go across the bridge. And the Italians that were boarding nearby there told the Robinson girls, yes, get in a wagon and go across there before he gets <laughs> Only man. <laughs> <laughs> what about the officers of the company? Do you know anything about? I think they their... did uh, the disappearing act. Okay. Although they they did elect the they had a board of directors, and as I said, they did uh, elect more officers. I don't know why really, but uh, I believe according to law they had to get permission from the state to disband. And so that's probably why they had officers. Again, they, they were still a, a corporate uh, body until they were completely dissolved. And when when did they dissolve? Uh, it would have been um, about a year later mm -hmm. when they could finally get the. I mean, it, they didn't exist by then, so dissolving was not not a difficult thing to do since there was no money. There was. Uh, no capital, uh, no rolling stock. There was no, there were no assets. So, so the uh, only work that was done was the roadbed. I mean, they right. didn't start building any of the no. other buildings. Or no, anything. it was just roadbed work. And they they did quite a bit of it when you consider six weeks mm -hmm. and all the different places mm -hmm. that uh, roadbeds exist. Mm -hmm. They really made some progress. But again, they were just heaping up what nature had provided. And it seems to have worked because those piles are still there. <laughs> I, I didn't see any uh, sawed huts, though. <laughs> this point. And the pipeline doesn't uh, start with the same kind of boost a little bit, did it, when it came through here? The oil line. Oh, I'm not sure where that goes. It goes up, so. It probably follows the same kind of natural uh, topography, I would think, that it, it would require the same kind of thing because they, they don't want to do ups and downs too much. You've got to keep it flowing. If anybody really wants to know where the sorted past is, I, I bought that land from Ted Howell, that field. And the roadbed is still there. If you look down from Town Farm Road, somebody starts snowmobile trails down. Parkway, and then it ends on my land there. Yeah, right at the river. I didn't know the sort of pass. <laughs> <laughs>
You won't go out looking for artifacts. No. Well, it's probably where the shots were fired. So. Yeah. It does end right there before they start going over the crooked rivers. Yeah. Yeah. That was going to take a lot more dollars, I guess. Oh, yeah. They didn't build any bridges. Bridges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much.